So I'm Rawa Ali, uh, and I am a research associate with uh, CODE, the Center on Dynamics of Ethnicity. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to this uh, workshop. Um, we named it on and off uh, screen diversity. Why, why, why does it matter? Uh, but we really want to touch on the cultural and creative industries in general um, and the issues of representation um, that we see and how that gets produced um, as well behind the scenes. So I'm just going to walk you through uh, the program of the day. So I'm going to have a, um, a 10 minutes a kind of uh, uh, introduction about the topic, um, about some of the research that we do as well, some of the findings that we have um, we have been gathering. Um, and then at two o'clock, we will have uh, the brilliant Saadia Habib and uh, Shaf Chaudhry from the risk test who, um, who, was, who are going to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, we will have 10 minutes for questions and then a comfort break um, at 2.30. And then uh, we're gonna start at 2.45 uh, with the amazing Josie Dobrin, who is the uh, Director of uh, Creative Access, um, who's going to talk about off-screen uh, diversity. Um, and then we're gonna end up with some questions. Um, as I said, the hashtag is media diversity and here are uh, our handles if you'd like to, to tag us or um, involve us in the conversation. So I'm just gonna start first um, by, you know, asking why does diversity matter? And let's, let's start with the social impact. Um, the cultural sector, including the media, TV, film, and theater influences our understanding of our social surrounding. And it also reproduces social values as well as roles of social engagement. And you can think here of, you can think of all the repeated stereotypes about minoritized groups, often negative, and just think of the impact um, th that has on social attitudes and social engagement. But also, culture and art are supposed to represent the soul of the nation and its citizens. Yet, it's not really true when it comes to, the, to ethnic representation in the UK, is it? There's also a lot of evidence to support the value of diversity in enriching uh, different cultural platforms, from diversifying stories and bringing fresh perspectives to storytelling to embarking on new ideas for cultural production, but also importantly, to diversify and increase audiences and therefore maintain cultural organizations. But I want to park all of that aside and I want us to think of inequality, pure and simple. Is it right that culture and its production should be exclusive? and that those who are from ethnically diverse backgrounds should be disadvantaged and excluded from being represented in culture or making culture. Ethnic, inequali ethnic inequalities have been and continue to be a problem in the cultural sector. We know that people from Black, Asian and racially minoritized backgrounds are underrepresented in the cultural industries. Tracking diversity in its funded organizations through annual reports, the Arts Council England found in 2020 report that ethnic inequality is prevalent and persistent. 11% of the workforce in national organization in the council's portfolio were from black and ethnically diverse backgrounds. Now the previous 2019 report, which did not integrate museums into the portfolio, showed a stark picture where the percentage of black and ethnically uh, diverse workforce was just 5% across its major partner museums and 3% in positions of leadership. In TV, a report from communications regulator Ofcom showed that ethnic minorities were also considerably underrepresented. It highlighted that 8% of those employed by TV 
broadcasters in senior management roles are from a minority ethnic group. These inequalities, however, were likely to exasperate due to the impact of COVID on the industry. With, uh, we, and we had actually concerns from the Select Committee for uh, Department of Culture, Music and Sport warning that, and I quote, pressures on the creative workforce will also impact on diversity and inclusion within the cultural sector. In a research project funded by the Economic and Social uh, Research Council that I'm working with, um, with Professor uh, Bridget Byrne, uh, who is at Manchester, and Dr. Onimek Saha, who is at Goldsmith University of London. So we, and we are working in collaboration actually with Creative Access, who's gonna be speaking next, in the next session. Um, we have been researching the impact of COVID on ethnic inequality and strategies to diversify the creative and cultural industries. We asked ethnically diverse respondents to answer questions pertaining to their work circumstances before COVID, during lockdown, and after the lifting of lockdowns. And there were stark differences between the percentage of respondents who were in employment before COVID, and that was 51%, and after lifting uh, of lockdowns, which was 29%. The percentage of ethnically diverse respondents who reported that they were not in education not in employment or training has also risen from 10% before COVID to 28% after lifting the lockdown. This analysis shows that not only did ethnically diverse people who are working or aspiring to work in CCIs, the cultural and creative industries, not only did they lose employment during the pandemic, but also those who finished their studies during the pandemic are struggling to get a job in CCIs. And although this is consistent with findings on the current state of job losses across the cultural sector, it is a worrying development for diversity efforts in the sector, considering that there is already an underrepresentation of ethnically diverse groups in the sector. This is all despite a number of leading cultural institutions introducing action plans and policies to improve their diversity. Over the last 20 years, there has been a number of diversity schemes, funds and, grant, and grants specifically geared towards increasing the representation of ethnically diverse people in the sector. In our research project, most interviewees stated that they would apply to a diversity scheme rather than a general one because they were painfully aware of the structural issues that would disadvantage them. However, they still had reservations about the negative connotation and efficacy of such schemes. In our survey, only 35% of ethnically diverse respondents said that diversity initiatives benefit their career. This should be understood within the context of the potential stigma on diversity schemes and the temporary and fixed nature of these initiatives. One of the ethnically diverse interviewees uh, clearly expresses the problematic connotation that the term such as a diversity hire conjures. And I quote, because then I don't want to be hired as a diversity. I want to be hired as because I'm competent. I want the obstacles to go away, but I don't want to become an icon of any kind. And another ethnically diverse interviewee explains the problem inherent in diversity schemes and why they don't always succeed. And I quote, my emphasis is less on how many of diversity schemes they are taking at a time and more on are you offering them or are you giving them the scoop to be offered a full-time job at the end? Because not having that security means my eyes will start straying or I'll start looking elsewhere." End of quote. Thus, paradox paradoxically, even though these schemes are made to empower ethnically diverse creatives and cultural workers, they can contribute to a sense of insecurity 
it feels like diversity is still understood as an add-on to the institutional daily life. And although diversity schemes offer one solution for addressing issues of entry to the sector, there are still questions about their long-term efficacy with regard to retention and the institutional instrumentalization of such schemes. And I'm sure that Josie uh, Dobrin, who is our guest in the second session, will have much insight to add here. But without further ado, let me please introduce our first session and our first two speakers, Sadia Habib and Shaf uh, Chaudhry. Um, and they are the co-founders of uh, the Risk Test. Um, and I would like to leave the space for them to introduce themselves and the Risk Test and also uh, uh, tell us, inform us about representation on stage, on screen. Take it away, please, Sadi and Shay. Thanks, Roa. Um, Shaf's going to share screen, hopefully. Can I, sorry, before, as, as Shaf is uh, sharing the screen, um, we are going to have 10 minutes for questions at the end of each session, but please also, if you've got any, um, any questions, if you want to uh, put them in the, in the chat, then I'm going to collate those and, and, uh, and we'll try to have a conversation with our speakers and with yourselves. But also, I, you know, I would encourage and I would love for our, our audiences to, to participate, so we'd love to hear, to hear your voice and, and, and see you as well. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to leave it now. Brilliant. Thank you, Chef. Um, I might ask you to kind of skip the slides for me at some point. So um, thank you so much, Roa, for inviting us here today to speak about um, our work, particularly um, regarding on-screen diversity and representation of Muslims um, and just how you've problematized off-screen um, diversity. We hopefully in our session, in our short presentation, will raise some um, points about how we need to think and problematize um, representation on screen. So just a little bit about ourselves and the RIS test. Um, yeah, so that's me, I'm Dr. Sadia Habib. I um, am part of CODE, um, who are convening this today. Um, CODE is the Centre for the Dynamics of Ethnicity um, based in sociology at the University of Manchester. And I'm also the, a young people's coordinator on a project called Our Shared Cultural Heritage at Manchester Museum. Um, I'll pass over to Shaf so he can introduce himself. Can you hear me okay? Brilliant. Um, yeah, my name is Shaf Chowdhury. I'm not nearly as accomplished as Sadia, Dr. Sadia Habib. I am a, uh, a techie at heart. I'm a data science professional with 15 plus years in the industry working across a number of different sectors. Um, a big part of what I do along with founding the risk test is I'm a data privacy advocate and I do a lot of research into biased algorithms. And I am also, along with Sadia, a contributing author to I Refuse to Condemn. I'll pass it back over to Sadia. Thank you. So um, I'm going to do the first part of the presentation and then we'll move over to Chef and you'll hear more from him. So for those of you who don't know um, much about the RIS test, it's a, um, a tool that we created after um, we, had, we shared our frustrations. So we're friends. Um, previously and, we're, and we've done anti-racist work together um, and we talked often about representation on screen particularly representation of Muslims and how this frustrated us um, and we felt um, just like Roa articulated earlier in the presentation in her presentation that the way culture is perceived is often um, central to reproduction of social values um, and we thought more about how we can challenge inequalities and how we can hold the industry to account and um, enable them to start thinking more uh, profoundly and deeply about respecting diversity and diverse audiences. So 
we felt that you know a lack of representation of Muslims or the very problematic um, represent, representation that existed had very real life consequences of rising Islamophobia um, and we, we could see how cultural representations can be linked to political developments in the real world um, and often dehuman, dehumanization of an entire group of people. Um, so we thought we, we came together and we had numerous criteria. Um, next slide, please, Chef. Yeah, so we had, I think we had about 50 plus criteria of the questions we wanted to ask of industry. Um, and then we realized that um, it would be really impossible for myself and Chef to, to kind of um, do all the reviews and do all this um, holding to account by ourselves. So we wanted to make a simple test that would be crowdsourced and be used by many people, many audiences, um, and also by students and so on. Um, and the main themes that arose for us were terror, culture and gender. So we essentially based the key questions around these themes. Um, next slide, please, Shah. So since we've launched in June 2018, so we um, have been, we've been um, asked, invited to write about the RIS test, write about its importance and why it matters. And also it's been written about um, in, around the world. So it's been, it's been really, really well received, um, which shows that there was a need for this in, in this kind of market of representation. There was a need for a tool like this. Um, it, uh, next slide, please, Chef. So as well as being adopted in the media by journalists and so on, um, we often get um, lots of academics and students contacting us. And it's really brilliant to hear students and their teachers and lecturers using the RIS test in their courses, um, in their dissertations and so on. Um, but obviously most importantly, we've, we're really, really, really grateful that audiences have adopted the RIS test. And we have um, numerous reviews coming in from audiences. Whenever there's new films or new TV shows that they're watching, they'll often RIS test it for us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why we think representation matters, why the RIS test matters, why it's been so well received, and what our kind of underlying philosophies and principles are, um, and some of the some of the key people who've inspired us. Um, yeah, thanks, Chef. So some of you will be familiar with Richard Dyer's work, um, and we we really we really buy into his work on representation. In fact, we were really honoured because um, we were invited to a to deliver a presentation on the RIS test at King's College a few months ago um, in London. And Richard Dyer was actually part of the audience and participating in our conversation. So we like the questions he asks about representation. He often asks about how um, we should think about representation. We should ask about um, what the representation suggests is typical, what isn't, who is, who is speaking, for whom, what is represented to us and why. So, and how is it representing the world to us? So these are key questions about representation that also inspired us to then create the RIS test. And one of his quotes that's on there, we think is really powerful is, how we are seen determines in part how we are treated. How we treat others is based on how we see them and such seeing comes from representation. And I, I'd like to say that this is kind of one of the fundamental uh, principles of why we felt it was necessary to have the RIS test. And we're also heavily influenced by Jack Shaheen, who, um, I've not got a slide on him here, but, he, but he's, some of you will know his work and he examined more than a thousand films um, in Hollywood. And his key findings were that Hollywood persistently maligned Muslims as sinister, untrustworthy, violent, 
motivated by greed, global domination, the destruction of the West. Um, and one of the things that he said in an interview um, just before he passed away in 2016, he, he said that um, in all the years that he'd been um, researching uh, the representation of Arabs and Muslims in Hollywood, so I think he'd been doing it for about 40 years, he said that in all those years, he, he hadn't felt as disturbed as he did around 2016 and 2015 to see that bigotry was still uh, alive and well and he felt really anxious about how the situation hadn't changed um, and then that makes me kind of neatly go on to Edward Said who's also another one of our influences as to why we created the risk test and again it, it reminds me of the words of Jack Shaheen because Edward Said obviously wrote a long time ago about Orientalism and about the media. Um, and some of, the, some of his writings and words are still very relevant today. And nothing, nothing seems to have changed, which is really troubling. Um, next slide, please, Shaf. Thank you. Yeah, so definitely I would say that these people, um, Richard Dyer, Jack Shaheen, Edward Said, are some of the kind of key people who've influenced our work in the RIS test. Um, so before I, before I hand over to Shaf, who's going to share some of the work we've been doing, I'm just going to talk through um, some of the representation that really kind of troubles us, and not just us, but other researchers in this field. Um, next slide, please, Shaf. So um, if you think about some of Jack Shaheen's work, he writes a lot about how often um, you get this sense of uh, gender representation, these tropes um, about Muslim women, Arab women as scantily clad belly dancers, as um, silent women shrouded in veils. Um, and of course, these are some really kind of key tropes that we're trying to challenge with the RIS test. And, these tropes might not exist so as much in um, films and TV shows now, but you'll see that um, we can problematize the, the kind of newer tropes about Muslim women, especially if you think about um, something like Bodyguard. So Bodyguard, I don't know if people have seen the BBC show. Um, it, it kind of represents a Muslim woman as both um, oppressed and the oppressor um, and at the time when Body Bodyguard came out in September 2018 we'd only just um, established the risk test and straight away immediately I think we'd put we'd put the risk test out in June 2018 and Bodyguard was shown in September and immediately audiences were contacting us to complain about the representation of the character Nadia in Bodyguard. Um, and the writers and producers were responding um, on social media, explaining that actually, no, this representation is complex. Whereas we would argue it's not really complex, it's just showing the same stereotypes. Um, but I'll come on to that a little bit um, more in a second. Um, next slide, please, Shaf. So um, it's really interesting to track how representation has changed over time. If you think about the films um, and TV shows that Jack Shaheen analysed pre-9-11, um, and then if you look at the ones post-9-11, you'll see that um, post-9-11, the kind of dangerous terrorist trope of Muslim men and oppressed Muslim women continue to feature in film and TV, but there were also some more sympathetic portrayals in shows like 24, Law and Order. Um, but again, like I just mentioned before, though even those sympathetic portrayals can be problematized. Um, and again, I'll come on to that shortly. Um, next slide, please, Shaf. And we've also we're also really kind of interested in how. Muslims are racialized and represented 
in other industries, other film industries. So, for example, some fans of Bollywood might assume or non-fans of Bollywood might assume that um, perhaps Bollywood would be, would be more sympathetic to Muslims considering um, India has such a massive Muslim population. But if you look at um, a lot of the research done there, you'll find that there's, there's traditionally been archetypes in Bollywood history too, um, archetypes of Muslims exoticized um, or, or seen as mar or marginalized where they're actually absent from um, on screen, or then later, 1990s onwards, um, they were demonized um, and often cast as villains. Um, and if you're more interested in that, there's a really brilliant book by Chada and Kavori um, called Exoticized, Marginalized, Demonized, The Muslim Other in India Cinema. And it really kind of deeply delves into how Muslims um, have been depicted and represented um, in racist and Islamophobic ways in the Bollywood industry. Next slide, please, Shah. Thank you. Okay, so finally, just to um, kind of sum up my segment of the presentation. Um, so, over the years, like I said, we've seen how um, representation has been really very, very kind of starkly problematic. And then since then, now producers and TV um, writers and film directors are arguing that they're now beginning to present uh, or depict more kind of complex um, ideas about Muslims. But we would argue that, um, and, and this is where we're inspired very much so by Professor Evelyn L. Sultani um, from the States. And she writes about how these sympathetic portrayals of Muslims fail to challenge negative stereotypes. And possibly they even sometimes reinforce negative understandings of Muslims and perpetuate biases. Um, so she she talks about she talks about the this as simplified complex representations. These are, she says, strategies used by TV producers, writers, and directors to give the impression that the representations they are producing are complex, but in reality, they're actually not. So, for example, there might be um, patriotic Muslims, or they might try and. Uh, show the plight of Muslim Americans post 9-11. However, often in these films and TV shows, you'll still see many stereotypes, for example, the fictionalizing of Muslim countries that are threatening the security of the West, or this idea that Muslims are, are, are living in a post-race society when actually it's not. So um, I think just to kind of end my section before you hear from Shaf, um, it's really important and linking back to the point that um, Roa made very early on, it's really, really important to be super critical of these representations because even though the impression is given that things have changed, sometimes they haven't actually really changed. We're still resort resorting to the same old stereotypes and tropes. And I'll pass on to Shaf now. Thank you, thank you, Sadia. Um, uh, following on with what Sadia said about um, critically engaging with with what we we have in front of us and, and what's presented to us, um, what I wanted to do is go through a contemporary example of of, of where um, how how Islamophobia kind of really kind of seeps into the the filmmaking process, and I wanted to do that by. Um, by by focusing on Islamophobia in, in the Marvel universe, now it's not it's not a it's not something that that immediately comes to mind when you think of bad examples of 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 um, movies. But I wanted to start with the Marvel universe and start at the beginning of the Marvel universe, which was back in two thousand and eight, when the first um, Iron Man came out. And um, and if we take a look at that, you, you think well. Did, did it pass or fail the RIS test? And now that you, you know what the criteria are, I, I thought from the beginning of the presentation, the five criteria we went through, um, when I look back at the movie, um, I found that it failed the RIS test. 
But then I thought, well, well, why does it fail the risk test? But what specifically about Iron Man, the movie, uh, was was problematic? But then uh, what I've broadly done here is is summarised the, the movie in one paragraph and and um, and you know please shout out if you disagree with this this characterization but um, Tony Stark is held captive in a in an Afghan cave by the Muslim Raza and the Ten Rings group. He's ordered to create weapons helped by the Afghan scientist from Gomera called Yinzen. Now broadly speaking, that's the origin story of of Iron Man, um, and. You know, on face value, okay, great. You know, it's the start of the franchise that goes on for 18 movies, and, and you know that 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 that's 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 grossed billions uh, of dollars. But what I wanted to do, me being a a your archetypal geek who who has read the the, the graphic novels um, from 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 way back when, I wanted to do a comparative analysis of the Iron Man film, the movie against the comic. Now, the Iron Man film was released in 2008. The comic was released in 1968. I wanted to do a quick analysis for, for two reasons. A, was the movie true to the, the, the source text? And second of all, just to see how that fared over time. Now, the paragraph I mentioned previously looked like this. Tony Stark held captive in an Afghan cave, 10 Rins group, great weapons by the Afghani scientist Yin Zen. Now, the Iron Man film was 2008. I compared that to the comic from 1968, and the source text looked a little bit different. It looked a little bit like this. In the graphic novel, Tony Stark was held captive in a Vietnamese cave by Wong Chu and the Ten Rings group. He's ordered to create weapons by the generic um, oriental scientist uh, called Ho Yin Zen. So you've seen how um, Ho Yin Zen has been um, quote unquote Muslimified into Yin Zen and how. Uh, Vietnam being uh, v- 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 Vietnam being uh, being switched over to um, uh, of, of Afghanistan. Now, it doesn't take a, a, you know anyone any any degree of of, of, of you know um, studying to, to know the historians among us know that 1968 was the height of the um, well just just after the, uh, the the Vietnam War. So you can see how geopolitics affects. Um, affects the story, the, the narrative. And back in 1968, Iron Man was actually created as a piece of propaganda, uh, anti-communist uh, propaganda. Now, um, fought forward to 2008, and, and broadly speaking, that's where you see the beginning of the, 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 the war in Afghanistan. So somewhere along the way, from 1968 to 2008, when it was first picked up that we should develop this into a movie someone somewhere in a production room in a writer's room made a very specific conscious decision to switch the bad person du jour from vietnamese to 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 uh, to afghani to afghan which is i find really interesting now what i wanted to do is go into a little bit about the methodology and some of the findings from 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 what since we've been started the risk test the risk test is broadly founded on three kind of um, source um, source avenues. The first one is the risk test reviews, and they were crowdsourced over and around the world. As Sadi mentioned at the beginning, we've had reviews sent in from around the world. We've been quite privileged to, to have a great community of people who watch movies and regularly submit uh, reviews to us. Uh, the second one being, as, as Sadia mentioned, Dr. Jack Shaheen, his 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 research um, broadly written in the book uh, Real Bad Arabs, and and also curated reviews. Um, this is uh, there are many movies that that Dr. Jack Shaheen didn't cover because he very much the scope of his research was very much around um, the Arab um, identity. And um, there are very many movies um, in history that are that are not Arab but are still Muslim. So that's where, that's where the curated reviews come to round out that that figure, and what we've done oh, since we started the project, we've now achieved um, uh, over one thousand two hundred movies, TV shows that have been reviewed and, and analysed. We've got this huge database of of reviews. The movies span from the the, the nineteen hundreds to the present day. Uh, we have people who watch who've seen Dune and the, the latest film in the cinema. And they've um, and they've and, and they've submitted reviews to us, and which which are wonderful. And again, it's global in scale. We're not just focusing on Hollywood or Bollywood or certain um, 
uh, regions. This is this is the the, the reviews we've had through um, represent the, the the broadness of of the film industry around the world. Um, what I wanted to do was to to help to to help you what look like what 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 one thousand one hundred movies and TV shows looks like is on the screen we've got one thousand one hundred squares. Um, broadly speaking, the, the 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 research that we've done, um, I found that ten uh, percent don't qualify. Ten percent of the movies that have, we, we've reviewed don't qualify the risk test. The the, the qualifying criteria being if there's a Muslim, that, that, an identifiable Muslim in 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 the in the movie, ten percent they haven't qualified. A further five percent didn't qualify because the movies were actually pre-Islam. Now, and, and, I, and I'm talking about movies such as uh, Anthony and Cleopatra, who, where there are Arabs, but they're not necessarily um, Muslim, and also the, any movies around ancient Egyptians. Um, moving on, um, I found that 5% um, don't qualify for the risk test, but they do include negative dialogue about, uh, regarding Muslims. Um, 80% of the movies that we've that we've that been submitted to us do qualify for the risk test. And interestingly enough, one movie doesn't qualify for the risk test, but does have positive dialogue about Muslim. That's one out of 1,100, which is less than, you know, that's, that's, that's a fraction of a percent. And if you're interested, that's actually raising Arizona with uh, Nicolas Cage from way back when. Um, so what we've done, just to summarise, what that looks like is that we've reviewed 1,100 movies and TV shows, globally sourced from the last 120 years. Um, and the question is, well, how many passed and how many failed? And, and the figures are quite stark. 87% of the movies that we've, that, that we've reviewed failed the RIS test, and only 13% of the movies that have passed. So that's 87% of 1,100 movies that, we've, that, have, that have been submitted to us and we've reviewed. Uh, fail the risk. So as, as that's that's a huge percentage. And to put that into some sort of context, I've, 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 I went to IMDb and I double checked. From the, from the year 1900 to 2020, there have been 6.6 .6 million movies and TV shows. So of the movies that contain, of, of, of those movies, um, only 0.00013% contain Muslims. And a fraction of that have positive representations of Muslims. Again, just to, just to show you where, and that goes to show just because there's representation of Muslims doesn't necessarily mean it's good representation. So not all representation is good representation. Um, at the beginning, Sadio spoke about the, the, the thematic analyses of the five criteria. So what we did, we, we took it down a level of, um, of, of analysis as well. So we took a look at the last 120 years so the, the, the thematic analysis of the misogynistic and oppressed Muslim. So what we found is that since the 1900s, there's been a constant presence of the Muslim man being presented as misogynistic and the oppressed female presented as, 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 as an oppressed figure um, and the, 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 as, as a common trope. And although the, the 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 trend line might be going towards that uh, go going down, but what we've seen is since the 1990s onwards, there's been a slight uptick, and we'll be interested to see where that goes next. The next theme is the angry slash backwards Muslim. What we can see is over the last 100 uh, years is that um, Muslims have. Uh, there's an ever-present um, uh, theme of Muslims being suspicious uh, and and backwards and and you know and, and just angry people. Um, and again, this is this is it's not going up or down, but it's just always been a presence, always been a presence in the last hundred years. Again, this is not the last ten years; it's the last hundred years, and that's pretty much the broadly speaking the history of cinema. But the, the next slide. I had to double check the 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 figures around it because it was because I saw I saw that saw that it's, it's the the results and they're quite stark. It's regarding the 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 theme of Muslims being seen as a Western threat or as a terrorist. But as you can see from the beginning of of the 1900s, um, uh, the, the 20th century, from the year 1900 to the year 2000, it, there's just been an exponential growth as to how Muslims are seen as a threat. Or, 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 or terrorists. Now, you might notice um, two specific um, trends that you've got a huge spike around World War II, 
we had, and what one and two, we had Muslims were seen as collaborated with the Nazis, and then uh, and otherwise further. And then as you as time's gone on, you see a a stark uplift in the 1990s onwards. And again, it doesn't take a a you know um, a lot to draw correlations between the geopolitics of the day. But we found that a very stark, um, very very stark statistics. That being said, it's not all bad news. Um, we have found some really great representations, and and just as we we call out where Muslims are represented poorly, we do have to call out where Muslims are being represented well as well. Now, um, some examples, uh, ROT being a great example, came out in 2019. One of the lead, the, the, I believe that this was the first. Um, uh, acting uh, role for many of the the, the 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 leading cast, and one of them actually won a BAFTA. Another one being Superstore, again um, on Netflix right now. Um, Said presented as a colleague in the store who regularly takes break to pray in the in the in the in the, in the store in cupboard. Something that we can all uh, relate to. Um, uh, the Romanovs. Um, there's there's a wonderful character called Hajar in one of the episodes um, on Amazon Prime. And finally, one of my favourite TV shows is Mr. Robot, uh, Transcend, presented as a just a brilliant hacker. Um, and and any mention of her faith or her religion is is is, is through the view of um, ignorance of, of others. It's actually a really well put together show. Um, I'd like to end it with with one specific example of of everyday representation and. Um, and one of my favorite, you know, working in tech, one of my favorite movies is Office Space back in 1999. And um, it's one of those kind of great shows, that, the great movies that everyone in tech has seen. And I wanted to go back and double check if it passed off the other risk test. And, um, and, and, and I was actually pleased to, 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 to know that, it, it, to, to see that it did pass the risk test. But one character stuck out to me, um, um, you know, very, very, you know, just, just, just stuck in my head, and it is Samir, as you can see on the screen, and, um, and, and I thought to myself, why, why does Samir stick with me all this, all these years? Why, why is this character stuck with me? He, you know, he works in tech. He's, he's, he's an irritating character who's irritated about everything around him. He hates his commute. He, he's, you can see him there getting really angry at the print of not working. And if you've seen the film, you'll know why. Um, and I thought, well, why has that character stuck with me all these years? And, and the answer is because it's me. It, that's that's me. I work in tech. I'm I'm sick of my commute, not so much over COVID because I'm working at home. But I'm a, I'm a, I'm an irritating character, and I get irritated by others. And and although that's a a, a you know, is it, it, it's funny to think of it that way, but. It just lends itself to, 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 to you know, to, for, for, for me to reflect upon how important it is to see yourself and uh, portrayed as, 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 as an everyday character and not otherwise, as we've seen elsewhere. So I'd like to end it there. Um, thank you very much. Um, and this is uh, I've got a little bit of information about the risk test and how you can get involved and get in touch with us or follow more of our research. I'm going to pass you back over to Roa. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Sadia and Shaf. This this has been brilliant, shocking, troubling, but absolutely brilliant. The the amount of work that you have done um, in in a relatively short amount of time as well. Um, it, it's fascinating. So thank you so much, and thank you for coming here. Um, and I just um, um, I just want to flag the at the risk test and flag people and ask them to, to follow you because I think your work is, is incredible and to submit contributions as well uh, to at the risk test. Um, also want to congratulate Sadia who's been nominated for the Manchester Cultural uh, award so um you know amazing work and uh, thank you i'm uh, i'm gonna open the floor for questions um if you would like just to unmute yourself and and tell us the the question and engage with us or um or if you would like to put a question in the in the chat um as well for uh for sadia shaf or any of the issues that we have been talking about uh, so far um, and if not, I do have, uh, I mean, I have so, so many questions, uh, but I don't really want to kind of take up the whole space. So I'm going to wait for a minute and, um, and see. Um, 
Yeah, I think I had one kind of. I, actually, I had I had two questions. Um, and the and the first one is, and I think this is something that you raise really well, um, which is often missed in the discourse on diversity. And that's the issue of intersectionality. Um, and you raised that a couple of times. And, you know, specifically, um, you, you raised um, the issue of, of, uh, of gendered Islamophobia. Uh, but I also want to add to the mix um, race. And I want to see if through your, uh, through your work and through the reviews that have been submitted, if you have seen an increase in uh, racialized representation uh, of Muslims, you know, particularly brownness uh, and, and kind of the link between that and, and Islamophobia. And I understand that this is kind of a, a big question, but whether this kind of intersectionality in the analysis, well, first, lack of intersectionality in, in the production of these uh, stereotypes, but, but second, how people are kind of being more aware about the intersectionality of these uh, elements, gender, race, religion, uh, coming together to create the other. Um, um, I'll let Shaf talk about the reviews in a second, if any come to mind. But um, I was just thinking about um, one of the positive effects of setting up the RIS test, establishing it, and it being so welcomed, is that I think um, people who work in the TV and film industry have started thinking a bit more deeply about intersectionality. So we often get um, filmmakers or writers and producers getting in touch with us. Um, and when they're working on their script, you can see that some of the questions that they're asking of their characters and of their storylines show that um, they are having more of an appreciation of nuance and intersectionality. Um, so I, I definitely feel like that has been a real kind of positive of the risk test. So even though the questions are quite basic, um, it then stems and sets off new new conversations and new questions and new ways of thinking about representation. So we'll look at, um, there's a, there's a um, question actually in the chat that links to this about have we heard of any public apologies from creators for failing the risk test and it's really surprising because we do feel like we're wielding a little bit of power with the risk test because we do get people contacting us saying well we're writing this show and we really want to pass the risk test and you know so there is this kind of um like awareness that the risk test has created um and but I think obviously there's still a long a long way to go when it comes to understanding Islamophobia and racism and, and the relationship between them both and how they link. And, yeah. and if, if anybody's really interested in that, there's a uh, there's really, really good work done by Salman Sayed from, uh, Professor Salman Sayed from Leeds University. Um, and he writes a lot about how Islamophobia is a racism um, and how Muslims are being racialized. So, you know, obviously, uh, um, there is no such thing as race, it's a social construct, but often features of racism and the way that people are racialized are now being mapped onto Muslim bodies. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's a lot of work to be done around that, actually. Uh, and I'll pass to Shaf, he might have, have something to add. Yeah, I, th I think it's really it's really interesting that the, the intersections, like for, for example, um, one of the w there's one really good example of how, how Muslims are portrayed well in a TV show, and that's it's going back a little bit to the 1990s. But there's a TV show called Oz, and um, set in prison, and um, there was there's a um, there's, there's an American uh, African American Muslim uh, who who is who's presented as a um, as, as as a kind of a wise sage of the prison and he's like you know he, he and his, his faith is is portrayed um as as a thing that gives him dignity and gives him you know social capital in in in, in the prison but if you step back from that he's still an african-american in 
prison. So it's so it, it, it's very complex when it comes to that's a good representation on one level, but poor representation on another. So the intersection is really, really, really fascinating. And um, and to 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 Sadie's point about having power, we had um, sometimes we get people reviewing movies that that don't. I think they they fail the risk test because they 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 feel strongly about the theme, but it doesn't necessarily fail the test. And there's there's a um, there's a movie called Tag. Um, it's like those one of those um, like this, this, it's like a comedy movie from a, recent years. Um, and someone sent submitted a review. I mean, we don't we don't we don't we don't review every single movie because we can't possibly do that because even though as much as we love to watch movies all day, we, we don't have time for that. Um, so someone reviewed it. We put it out on on Twitter, and um, and, I, and I can't tell you his um, his name because he has not to be mentioned. But one of the leading cast members of that Hollywood movie got in touch with us and they said, actually, no, 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 it doesn't fail the risk test because to, to the letter of the test, it's X, Y, Z, and we and they actually sent a YouTube video of the specific scene. And we were amazed. Sadie, Sadie and I were, were amazed that someone like a this is a you know this is a, a Hollywood actor who has millions of followers, and um, they, they took the, the time to, 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 to privately message us and correct us on, on that. Um, a really great question, actually, from um, um, Allah on, on, on the, on the was it, oh, sorry, no, Anamic, actually, uh, Anamic, regarding the nuance. And, and I think the risk test is purposely not a nuanced test. It's, five, it's only five criteria. And, you, and, and like, as I said, Sally and I came up with a huge list of criteria at the beginning that we kind of whittled it down to five. So we, we know full well it's a blunt instrument for it, it, specifically speaking about four lions. Now that's a that's a really interesting example because personally I find that 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 passes the risk test because it's it's satire and it's and it's and it is and Chris Morris went to great lengths to research that um, um that that the 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 research that went into that. But then other people the letter of the test fail the risk test, so it's so it's not it's not meant for nuance. I, I don't think the the industry is in a nuanced position right now. So I think what what the what the industry needs is a is is a blunt instrument, if you will, that that, that it needs to kind of shock and and wake up to that. So um, Sadi, you've got any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, just to kind of echo what you've just said, I I, I agree wholeheartedly that I feel like we're nowhere near in a position to. Um, uh, even though we want them to be more nuanced, at the moment we need to hit them over the head with the RIS test, so to speak, metaphorically. And then hopefully, like I said before, then those, um, once those relationships are set up, those nuanced conversations begin. And um, and this kind of links to the question that, um, also excellent question that Arla's asked about, would you argue that um, this underrepresentation under is a deliberate intentional action or one due to a lack of education, as arguably we live in a very diverse society today. And I think that's such an important question, and that speaks to like my various hats as um, working with young people in museums, as a teacher, as a researcher. Um, you know, I often find that um, there's no excuse for this kind of misrepresentation and underrepresentation, because, like you've said, there we live in a very diverse society today, and I feel like. Um, if people claim, if people who have these positions of power and influence as writers and producers and directors, if they plead ignorance, I feel like that's not an excuse because you, your ignorance is intentional. You you choose to be ignorant. You know what are you doing about that ignorance? So that would be my kind of response to that. Yeah. That Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Sadia and Shaf. Um, I've got one more question, which I'm really interested in as well, because I have a background in theatre. And Hannah uh, asked if you cover theatre in the risk test at all. Um, and I, and if not, then possibly could it be in the future? Uh, could it be a thing in the future? Yeah, Shaf and I often have conversations about books as well, books and theatre um, and how to kind of open up the risk test so that we can get more submissions um, that relate to other aspects of the cultural industry. So, yep, hopefully that will be kind of next. So watch that space. 
Um, thank you. I mean, I've, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish in two minutes, but I just want to kind of finish with one question if, if it doesn't require a, a long answer. And that's what does it mean to you to have a public uptake of the risk test? It's, it's a, it's a collective effort, isn't it? Um, what does it mean, you know, to have, to have something you two started and that is, has, has mushroomed globally? Um, and, and it's become, it's become like a collective initiative. Uh, so just wanted to see if you've got any comments on that before we go into the break. Uh, so from, from my perspective it was um it was intent it was intentionally done that way because um because i think as, as much as sadly i would like to we we can't control we can't we can't this is not something we've invented this conversation has happened over dinner tables and in houses on on the way home from the cinema and the theater f f forever so all we've done is provided a a a kind of a, a prism or, or a rubric or a, a, a a set of rules to kind of measure what we already discuss and want to put it out there for everyone to kind of embrace and and, and we're, we've been absolutely um overwhelmed by the support uh, behind it what are, you, what are your thoughts Sadia? yeah just to add to exactly what chef said agree 100 percent. and just something that um i think that a lot of people here in the audience would probably hopefully agree with is that um a lot of this activism is about social movements and collective kind of power and so I think one of the most kind of important decisions that we made was that we didn't want to kind of this to just be our project we wanted to share it with the world and for people to get involved however they want to get involved and to, to kind of move this forward and drive it forward and and I feel like that has had because we've shared it out and we've been really open and willing to have conversations with academics and students and the media and even um, bodies like BAFTA and BFI um, have um, established really good relationships with us. Um, so I've been sitting on the um, BAFTA uh, Committee for Equality and Diversity, which was set up after BAFTA were criticised, but you know BAFTA so white when it was the uh, the BAFTA BAFTAs, and also the BFI have been so brilliantly supportive of Shaf and myself and the RIS test, and they've given us opportunities to come and do training with their staff, and um, we're on their Muslims on Screen advisory panel, um, and I think so. We've, I feel like a lot of that power comes from the fact that it is a collective uh, kind of endeavor. Yeah, thank you, Sadia yeah, and, and Shaf. That, that's that's absolutely brilliant. So, I, you know, I, I'm sure all the audience will clap with me. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, we are going to take 10 minutes uh, comfort break and then uh, come back uh, to, to, to listen to Josie and engage with Josie, who is the director of Creative Access, on kind of how those representation come to happen. Um, on 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 screen and what 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 it means to have diversity off screen. Um, so I um, yeah we'll 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 reconvene in in ten minutes. Thank you. So hello and um, welcome back. Um, we've got for this second session uh, we've got Josie Dobrin who is the director of uh, creative access. Uh, an organization that supports underrepresented creatives and cultural workers to thrive in the creative and cultural industries. Uh, and I'm really pleased to, to and excited to hear um, what Josie is going to, to tell us. Also, um, we have been uh, actually in collaboration with Creative Access on a, a previous uh, current research project that um, uh, Professor Bridget Byrne and uh, Dr. Anamik Saha are working on. So also gratitude for, for, for that and, and thanks for, for, the, for the collaboration and we think it's an important project. But without further ado, I'm gonna leave uh, the, the space for Josie. Uh, uh, and um, and as, um, as always, please, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat or if you'd like to wait until 
at the end of the session, then we would be more than happy to, to, to see you and, and hear your question. Um, yeah, if you want to take it from here, Josie. You're, you're muted, sorry. Can you hear me now? Perfect, lovely. Um, sorry, I'm like fiddling around with my, uh, there we go. Uh, so hello, and thank you very much for having me. And thank you, especially for Roa for inviting me to, to speak today. And to Sadia and Shaf for their really inspirational talk for I was absolutely fascinated and it's such important work you're doing over at the RIS project. So um, thank you for all of your time on that. Um, as a, um, thank you for the introduction. So my name is Josie. I'm Chief Executive and Founder of Creative Access, which is a uh, social enterprise. Um, we work across the creative economy in the UK and I'll tell you a little bit more about us shortly our mission is to support those from communities that are underrepresented across the, the industry to enter and thrive once they get in um, and you can follow us on our hashtag there so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why diversity matters because actually that's exactly the question that Roa asked me when she started and um, said this is what I want to know and obviously we've talked about on-screen diversity but for us we focus very much about off-screen and behind the scenes and why does it matter and um, the thing that oh sorry about these builds I don't know why they're there but anyway um, Obviously, for us, it's not just about the right thing to do. This, not, this is not a kind of worthy philanthropic endeavour. It's really about much more than that. We, the bottom line is that inclusive broadcasting is simply good for business. And I'm sure you've all seen the figures, the McKinsey report is showing that you're much more likely to get about 30% better financial returns um, if you have a more diverse workforce and, and the opportunity there that we have a potential 24 billion a year boost of those from ethnic diverse communities progressed at the same rate. So it's not just about bringing in people, it's about uh, progression too. So I'm just gonna kick off, I don't know about any of you, but I'm a big Grey's Anatomy fan. And I just wanted to quote the amazing Shonda Rhimes. Shonda Rhimes. Now she talks about diversity here. This quote I think is really powerful. She says, the word diversity suggests something other, as if it's something special, as if there's something unusual about telling stories involving women and people of color and LGBTQ characters. I have a different word, normalizing. I'm normalizing TV. And of course, that's what we're all trying to achieve here. And I think um, that's a really powerful comment just to kick off um, the conversation. Um, what is the current situation? Um, there's lots of stats around. I've gathered a few of them here. We're obviously due a new census in the next uh, year or so, but the last one showed us already that London's well over 40% non-white and a quarter of all under 25 year olds are from non-white backgrounds. Uh, the the uh, Screen Skills Workforce Survey back in 2012, and I point this out because this is what the one of the catalysts for creating creative access in the first place, showed that the proportion of creative industries workforce that's non-white was sitting at between just four and 6%. And it does vary both at level, so entry level and you know right through to senior level. And we know in fact, um, uh, Shaf mentioned it earlier how poor it is at leadership levels, but also um, across creative industry. So it might be slightly different in journalism and museums and galleries and theatre, etc. Um, in TV specifically, the latest survey shows that 20% of the TV working population is over 50, but of course, over 30% of the total population is. So there's definitely an ageism issue going on here. And, and really significant, the Ofcom report in September 19 showed that people working in telly are twice as likely to have attended private school than in the general population. So that's a really important point there. Um, Shaf also talks about the intersectionality of the communities with whom we're working. I think that's really key. You know, what we like to separate them, but in fact, there's a big overlap. One in five people in the UK live in poverty. Um, and, and, and a lot of these individuals will be have disabilities, maybe from ethnic diverse communities, et cetera. So it's really key to um, bear some of these situations, these statistics in mind. And of course, we can't forget the COVID effect. And that is a really important thing to set the context for the current years. It's had a huge impact on our community. And when I talk about our community, we, we work, as I said, with anyone from underrepresented backgrounds. So those from ethnically diverse communities, people with from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, people with disabilities, people who've come to the UK 
as asylum seekers or refugees, people who are care, care leavers or caregivers. We did assert pre-COVID, the likelihood of one of our trainees being kept on post internship was 90%. And this fell massively to just 15% in the immediate aftermath of, of COVID, um, which is huge. But of course, it has started to pick up, but it's not yet back to our, those pre-COVID levels, partly because of the big, um, the devastating effect of the virus on, on the arts in general. Um, just another couple of things about the COVID effect. We ran a survey back in May last year um, of individuals within our community. We're just repeating it at the moment, actually. Um, so we're going to have a look at how this has um, impacted sort of as we emerge from the pandemic. But the survey shown that 40% of people um, said they'd already run out of money. And a couple of really key stats here, nearly 70% of people said their mental health was suffering due to the to, to coronavirus. Um, and 80 percent of people saying their priority was to find a new job or freelance work. So that's really, really some really critical facts. I want to just talk briefly about why this situation that I've highlighted just now has arisen in the first place and perhaps and then um, talk a bit more about what we can do about it. So we know there's a history of unpaid internships, that cycle of kind of privilege, perpetuating privilege, only those that can afford to work for free being able to, to take up opportunities. That hasn't, it is changing, but it has not yet changed. So there's still work to do there. There's a real lack of role models. I cited the fantastic Shonda Rhimes. There's not enough of them, of, of Shondas to go around still, especially at senior leadership levels. And we still face that kind of parental pressure to go, I should say pressure, not profession, parental pressure to go into sort of professional careers albeit, you know, medicine, law, et cetera. Um, there's a real issue around access routes. A massive 85% of creative industry roles are still recruited by word of mouth. Not so much in the big companies, but of course, 80 to 85% of the creative industries are small businesses. So a lot of these organizations have just literally found it difficult to, to establish a diverse workforce that reflects their local community or society at large, whether it's through internal resources or just through lack of time and you know, going to their, their inner circle to recruit. Um, and of course, financial barriers are a big, big obstacle. We did another survey just a couple of weeks ago of nearly 2000 young people which showed that 77% 70, 77 of those that we surveyed, so from the communities I mentioned, have not applied for a job due to the associated cost of high living or commuting costs, which is absolutely vast. Um, in addition to that, a third, 35% of people have refused job offers because of financial obstacles, so they've not been able to take up offers that they've gone through the process of applying for. Um, and 47%, so nearly half of those people surveyed said that financial barriers have greatly impacted their career progression. Um, and for those financial, that, that covers everybody from you know, all walks of life. And this rises to 61% of those from underrepresented socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's really key. And I think, you know, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, but one of the things that we've done as a result of this is we've launched a bursary fund in conjunction with McLaren, who's funded us given us some money for a kind of seed fund for um, people to be able to apply for individual pots of money to support them, be it for training costs or relocation costs or um, computer or any other kind of equipment costs that they might need. So we're really proud to have been able to launch that in the last couple of weeks. Um, right. Here is another amazing man, the fantastic Idris Elba. I'm just going to cite something that he has said and I think again this is a really he really captures the ethos of of creative access actually although he's got nothing to do with us sadly um when you don't reflect the real world too much talent gets trashed thrown on the scrap heap talent is everywhere opportunity isn't and talent can't reach opportunity and I think that really gets to the heart of of creative access and I'm just going to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do and then I'm going to come to some ideas of how we can perhaps collaborate together um, this point about opportunity not being everywhere is something that we're really working very hard to address. We have um, we launched a campaign last year called More Than Words. Um, there's a lot of narrative around um, the diversity and inclusion agenda. And I think what we want is to see people actually walking the walk and not just talking about it. We ask all our partners to do three things, which is to widen the talent pool when they're recruiting, to include candidates from all different backgrounds, to invest in those staff from underrepresented groups so that enable them to progress through to more senior levels, 
and to create an inclusive workplace so that everyone, whatever their background, feels valued and able to flourish within the workplace. Um, this is just a few examples of some of the companies we work with in, you know, across the screen world. Most of the broadcasters, BBC, ITV, Sky, Discovery, um, loads of little independent production companies, the length and the breadth of the UK. And as I said, we work across other creative sectors. So publishing, journalism, museums, galleries, campaigning organisations, um, et cetera. Any, what we broadly describe as the creative economy. So any organisation that has a creative function, but not necessarily deemed to be a creative industry itself. Um, a few quick headlines. So we place over 2,000 young people in paid internship and many more in permanent and freelance roles. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, going to sneeze there. Um, we've got our current tallies, uh, nearly five and a half hundred employer partners. And the conversion to full-time roles, as I mentioned, was 90%. It's creeping up a bit. It's probably not entirely accurate now. Um, but what we are very proud of is, is, is the number of people that we supported with employability skills. So that is people who have um, had CV clinics, covering letters, support, um, interview practice, um, masterclass attendance. We run monthly masterclasses on all different creative industries um, and practical skills as well. So we're doing what we can. A lot of people come to us and say, oh, I don't really know what I want to do, but I like, I'm interested, I like reading or I like to working with people. And they won't have even heard of the sorts of roles out there. They won't know the difference between production and editorial and television. They won't know what rights are or what, even what a commissioner is. So it's incumbent on us to really educate people about the breadth of opportunities out there. For us, it's really critical about what goes on behind the screen, behind the camera, because that's where the influence will, we believe will really impact, will make on the content on the output, which is really, really critical. Um, we've got three broad um, areas in which we work. We, ha we have recruitment services, we have a, a specialist jobs board where people can advertise roles and hopefully widen the funnel of people applying to them. Um, we talk, we want a, we have a, we uh, have a phenomenal team that focuses on affirmative action. Um, for me, affirmative action is absolutely not at the expense of anyone else. It's about a really effective way to push the limits of the law to enable to bring people in legitimately from underrepresented communities. And if they're then good enough at the end of the internship, if you've ring fenced a role for people from different backgrounds, they can then go on to um, apply for a full time job or a, a, a real employment opportunity within, you, within your organisation. We do open mornings and insight days and virtual work experience. And we're just moving into kind of mid to senior level recruitment as well. Our outreach and support, our programs team does, it's really, I would describe as the beating heart of our organization. It's where we do all our work with candidates from um, encouraging people to pursue creative careers right through to um, supporting them once they're in organizations. We feel it's really critical. To, it, you know, for us, it's retention is key. It's not just about bringing people in, although that, of, course, of course that's vitally important. It's also about being able to support people to progress through to organizations. So what we want them to do is really feel empowered to um, see themselves as leaders so that other people do. And we do that through lots of um, mentoring programs and through all sorts of um, leadership training and and other budding support and we do a lot around mental health and well-being I mentioned that 70 percent statistic before of people who felt struggled with uh, their mental health so we've worked really hard to work we work with senior clinical psychologists to support our community through um, information and through kind of reflect, regular reflective practice sessions to, to support people and all sorts of issues come through whether it be imposter syndrome or managing microaggressions and it's something that we work at very hard around kind of peer support to, to, to enable people to feel confident to, to um, progress through we often hear of that glass ceiling we really feel that it's like peer support is a really strong way to, to um, prevent that from getting from being too tough an environment. Um, the last area of our work is around employer training. Um, and the reason we introduced that about three or four years ago is because actually what we were looking at is, um, about, we did a lot of time working with young people or the individuals on our programs, but actually what we didn't focus on is the fact that actually a lot of workplaces themselves need to be help a bit more support to become more inclusive. We feel a lot of people, we know from experience that a lot of organizations, a lot of individuals don't feel confident, confident with the language, with the um, 
they don't feel confident to kind of articulate to be a white leader, but actually be able to be an agent for change and actually lead inclusively themselves and the language around um, the, the diversity agenda. So we do a lot of work around unconscious bias and, you know, inclusivity training um, and, and leadership training and all sorts of focusing on individual areas like it might be looking at race in the workplace or age in the workplace or gender bias in the workplace or all these different characteristics that come up time and time again and to be truly inclusive you really need to be able to um, kind of understand and challenge yourself at all those levels it's often about knowing your data knowing where you are I think if you know um, what you've what you're as an organization you have to do, you can benchmark yourself and actually um, set targets and really make a difference. And I think one of the things about COVID in the last you know, year and a half has been that, and, and certainly the emergence of um, the Black Lives Matter campaign taking much more prominence after the death of George Floyd is that it has been a catalyst for change across the TV and screen sectors and, and other creative industries too. And we hope that you know, that will really lead to systemic change in the long term. Uh, nearly finished. I just want to talk about some specific initiatives that we've seen that have been really powerful. Um, so mentoring programs. Now mentoring we know is a really powerful initiative to support people with career progression. Um, we won quite a lot of programs, both for people wishing to enter into the industry and also people wishing to progress through. So people who want a bit of support to perhaps get access to a pay rise or to promotion or to um, additional training for example and we, we have a really sort of well constructed program where we train both the mentors around everything from kind of accessibility and safeguarding and the mentees to enable them to get the most out of the training and we've seen some fantastic results at the back after the back of this and some pro so um itv for example are, are running a, they've made a commitment for them till 2025 that they have all of their management um they have about 150 live mentoring partnerships at any one moment where they're bringing people in and actually it's a, it's a clever way a sort of a long way um playing a long game when it comes to recruitment because ultimately they are although it's not directly recruitment related many of the people that they are mentoring will, will end up back at ITV I suspect um, outreach events so and virtual work experience again encouraging people to get a bit of an insight about what it means to work within a creative organization um, we ran this summer a fantastic kind of eight week program with discovery um, where each week they had a different um, focus whether it was like looking at fan mail looking at sport looking at news looking at um legal and hr and all the different sort of opportunities and i think and off the back of that um and these were people who were either still at school or undergraduates and it's been a really fantastically um successful initiative um i talked about affirmative action i'm really a big big believer in it i think it's a really fantastic way to um bring people into organizations to give them the access to actually try things out get you know be able to learn and then ultimately apply for a role we do lots of kind of cohorts of organizations we've had a cohort of people through the bbc for the last eight years between 10 to 20 people and some of our individuals now i, I turned on the news at 10 about three two three nights ago and there was two of the lead stories reported on by some of our alumni which is a phenomenally gratifying thing to do and it just shows actually and it's because they're bringing their own um their own their own stories to the table and really making a difference to the kind of content that's drive that's being delivered on our screens um leadership programs really powerful we've done a big leadership program with um, Guy Ritchie called um, Set Access, which, which is focused on young black filmmakers in the film industry. Uh, really important to try and support people through to get through to senior levels. You know, I, I like to use the term, the term a sunset organization. And for us, that's really about um, believing that one day we'll be put out of business because once we've got people around that board table, then that's really when um, we know that we've made, a, you know, our work will almost be done. And, and I mentioned the bursary fund earlier. So just things that we can do, and I welcome your thoughts on these as well. We talked about mentor, mentorship and sponsoring. I mentioned here performance indicators because increasingly we're seeing that people are having them as part of their appraisals. Um, and it's a kind of, it's a measurement by which people can be, uh, ke ke you know, for, for both financial appraisals and otherwise. And I think it's a really great thing to be able to bring the kind of um, inclusivity into that arena. Um, commercial imperatives, you know, we've seen with the BFI's Three Ticks programme and with other initiatives, like a lot of the, um, the film funds where you cannot simply get a commission unless you can demonstrate that you have a more diverse 
workforce and we and we feel that's really valuable you can learn other sectors can learn what the screen industries do just as the screen industries can learn from other sectors i mean there's some fantastic initiatives like press pad and the spare room project in publishing where actually they have um free rooms for people moving to london to work or subsidized accommodation for people coming to move to london which i think the, the screen industry industries could um learn from and it's just really about you know seeking different perspectives challenging biases does everyone in the room have the same access to information does everybody in the room give get the same share of voice do they all feel equally valid valued so there's lots of things that we can we can start to do um i'm going to stop there because i feel like i've spoken for quite a long time but just to say please do um, follow us we have a lot of resources on our website um and we'll constantly do things on social media so you know we're all at, at underscore creative access so i'd really love to um, engage with any of you that want to continue this conversation. And I know that um, Ro has got some questions and, and hopefully you will do too. And thank you very much for your time and for listening to me. Thank you so much, Josie. Uh, I mean, this was, I think this was really powerful in the sense of kind of articulating the, the value of diversity and the problems and, and, and the work that you've been doing at Creative Access, which I think is, is amazing. Um, we have a question from uh, Anamak. Um, if yes, hello Anamak. Hi Josie, hi Ro, thanks for, uh, Josie, thank you so much um, for presenting the amazing work you do at creative access this is slightly disingenuous because you and i have had this conversation but i'd like to maybe unpack it some more for the benefit of like everyone in the virtual room right now but that's about affirmative action and so obviously creative access of the amazing impact you've had has been because of this particular and peculiar loophole i guess where internships um where you can prove that there is under representation of certain communities and particular organizations you can have a, you can apply affirmative action or positive discrimination um, initiatives to internships and obviously this has been you know you've had a huge impact this way and you know honestly i just can't even imagine what the state of the culture and creative industries would be like now if if creative access wasn't around i think that is generally i think how i feel about the magnitude of what you're doing i just want to see think about what how that might apply beyond you know that junior level the inter the entry level is that, you know, in, in my own research, I found that, you know, everyone, like I've spoken to a load of senior people and mid-level people, everyone's on the diverse, you know, on diversity. No one, no one resists it. But the minute you start talking about po positive discrimination, affirmative action, you get a very, very, very different response. Challenges, you know, not least for the way it challenges their ideas of create these industries as meritocratic, which, you know, mm. clearly they aren't because the evidence clearly shows that there's a stark absence of people from underrepresented communities, which makes them underrepresented in the first place. So anyway, my question is, is that what do you suspect would be, is there, is there um, a bigger, I guess, I guess it's a political movement. It's a big campaign. It involves lobbying around affirmative action in these industries which have you know research shows time and time again historically marginalizes and excludes is that is that something that you can even countenance um i feel like entry-level jobs everyone's happy with that because it's not an immediate threat mm -hmm. to the ceo mm -hmm. but it always makes me laugh when they set mm -hmm. these targets well you know by 20 whatever the you know the composition of our board will be 20 15 11 percent you know eth ethnically minor you know, minority groups but well, okay, how are you going to do that and who are you going to remove in order to make that, you know, um, happen? So, yeah, that was my question. I mean, that's a really, you're absolutely right. I don't think people, sometimes it's not just about getting rid of people. It's just about making that table a bit bigger because like you said, it's not so easy to get rid of people. Um, but actually it's a really important, I mean, first of all, just to pick you up on something, there is a big difference between affirmative action and positive discrimination. Positive discrimination is illegal. Affirmative action is not. You can't discriminate against anyone, but you can affirm them, you know, so I think that's really important that that terminology, um, because, you know, we have, to, we've actually been doing a lot of work around the legality, partly in, in, in reference to your point about actually what we're trying to do is being able to support affirmative action in, at mid to senior levels, which is a, exactly the point that you raised there. And we're seeing that, um, you know, there is the law, you know, depending on who you consult and we know, and I'm sure that, I don't know if there's any lawyers on this call, but we know that um, as far as we're concerned, we want to be able to push the law to the absolute limits of 
being able to actually make an impact. And if that, and, and as far as we're concerned, we know very clearly that a role can legally be ring fenced if you can prove there's an underrepresentation in that area, and if you can demonstrate that it's a training opportunity and not a job. And actually, at mid to senior levels, there are ample opportunities for training. So we feel quite strongly that we should be able to use that as a vehicle for mid to senior level opportunities. And we're introducing in a couple of really exciting new projects at the moment that I'm hoping to be able to announce next week, like really big projects exactly on that point. And we've seen it elsewhere, you know, the BBC run their commissioners um, program and etc. So I don't know. I, I feel like it's not as widely used as it could be. Um, and I feel that, um, yeah, we could be doing a lot more around it, whether we have go for a campaign or not, I'm not entirely sure, but for sure we should be doing more. Um, um, just picking on that, because I think, I, I mean, I just, I'm just all fired up by, by this conversation and, and I know how important it is. Um, and you know, making room for internships where it's it's often short term, um, often without guarantee of a, of a long term employment, and then kind of people having to find other jobs to to make a living. Um, so, what you know, what kind of lobbying, what kind of support would you need from people around? Um, you know, using this wonderful audience that we have here as a as a starting. Uh, point all of us you know what what can we do to support this um and and do you feel um do you feel that I mean I know that you're mentioning that there are two projects which I'm so excited about but I know I can't hear about them until next week um but do you feel that there is a space that we can that there is a space now or do we need to lay the groundwork for it and maybe kind of I think it's I you know <laughs> I think there is a, it's a kind of a yes and no answer, which is not very helpful. Um, I think that, you know, I've mentioned this a few times, it's, for me, it's about retention and progression. And, and that is the key thing. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about catapulting people in from different sectors in order to work at more senior levels. And we hear that story quite a lot. And it's not it's not always fair on that individual in question because you're all, you can be seen to be setting them up to fail if they don't have that kind of level. You need a really structured support package around it. So I think, you know, at Creative Access, we're working really hard to make sure there's a supplementary program that sits alongside whatever level you're in. Because if you genuinely want to see a change, then, you know, you have to be able to look at it it's just really key that those individuals are sponsored that they are mental they've got the support of the senior management they've got people recognize that you know the last thing that anybody wants to be is a token and we hear this time and time again I don't want to do this if I'm a token and, and why should they quite rightly you know it has to be that they're for for their genuine difference of opinion we've talked a lot about the economic impact of um, having a more a diverse workforce and that has to come you know and I think it's just about replaying those messages keeping up the pressure making sure people are you know that opportunity that we talked about you know talent is everywhere opportunity is not it's opening those doors it's providing as much possible access as we can thank you <coughs> and, uh, um and i also just want to link up to um a comment or an observation that we had from uh, Sadia and Shaf's um, earlier presentation about intersectionality. And it's often a thing that gets really missed in those diversity initiatives. You know, you have a, di you know, you have a diversity initiative for ethnically diverse or, uh, or, or, or um, you know, to, to increase gender uh, representation when often, you know, you have all of these, uh, um, categories or identities, uh, identity categories that are um, underrepresented are often present in one person who could be ethnically diverse, who could be from a working class or uh, uh, um, uh, disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds and a woman and disabled and, you know, um, and that intersectionality is often missed um, in those. And I, and I find that kind of that narrow um, approach to um, to, to to addressing the lack of diversity really problematic, but it also links, for example, as well with the current um, the current focus on leveling up, um, even in the culture and creative industries, um, and in a way that shouldn't or should be pitted against 
increasing diversity, ethnic, ethnically diverse or ethnic diversity in the sector, where the two actually come together because, you know, quite a lot of people from ethnically diverse backgrounds come also from uh, socioeconomic backgrounds that are disadvantaged. And I'm just wondering in your in your work in in your area, uh, sorry, in the in your campaigning and the work that you do, how much does that intersectionality feature or is kind of forgotten or erased? And and why not? You know, why why those underrepresented people are only seen through one category or the other? Yeah, I do agree with that. I think it is forgotten time and time again. And then we see a kind of diversity hierarchy where people look at skin colour, um, for example, quite rightly is, you know, there's a reason why Black Lives Matter is called Black Lives Matter, because, you know, historically, um, you know, they've been at the bottom of the pile, but that doesn't mean to say there's not other imp- other things affecting individuals. And I think that's the key. And what we see the real problematic issue for us is when organizations take on an individual and then they say, oh, well, they're not really working out. It's like, but you chose, you knew that you came to us because you wanted somebody with a different perspective. So make sure that you include them, make them feel valued. It's not a one size fits all for the way that you manage people, the way you induct people, the way that you appraise individuals. You have to be able to look at this intersectionality and understand what a lonely place it can be if you're the only person that doesn't, you know, that whose parents didn't go to university or you might be dyslexic or dyspraxic or you might have a different skin color, all these things. It's, it's very isolating and they are cumulative. So I think it's, a frustration for me that people think they want to do the right thing but when push comes to shove if that person's not way above par according to their own standards it's like maybe it's just about looking more creatively or you know we know that if you, you can really embrace individuals by just modifying your workplace practices a little bit it's very straightforward and those individuals will thrive and that's why you want that difference in the first place you're not doing it just to tick a box so it's a real it's it's, it's a really tricky um issue that we see time and time again and the best employers are the ones that are the most um, adaptive with their, um, the way that they onboard and, and, and sort of talent manage those individuals. Thank you so much. I've got a couple of questions, but I want to wait because I, I don't, I don't want to uh, kind of uh, occupy the space too much. So if there are any questions from our audiences, if they'd like to put them either in the chat or just unmute yourselves and... and uh, um, and kind of talk to us. We're very well, you know, we w- would love to hear your questions. Um, in the meantime, I think, you know, from our research, um, it came quite a bit, you know, a lot of things came, but one or two things, uh, the, the, the first one was the, the fact that the industry is a ne- uh, nebulous industry um w- without without much a structure and uh, and this is a point that you made in your uh, uh presentation of you know it, it, where do they learn about these jobs how do they know about the structure of these jobs and then how do they apply for them when it's often uh, word of mouth um, and I'm, I'm i'm wondering through creative access how are you addressing this kind of um this this structure which is very hard to 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 get your head around, um, uh, you know, as someone trying to get into the creative and cultural industry, it's, it, there's no one entry point. Um, and and uh, yeah, and I'm just wondering if creative accesses can help or address that or make it a bit easier for your constituents to navigate the industry and, and, and how unstructured it is. Yeah, I think, you know, you raise a really important point. And, you know, there are a lot of initiatives out. There's a lot of local initiatives. There's a lot of sector specific initiatives for each industry. Um, you know, wouldn't it be great if everything was under one roof? But I don't know that, that was, that's that's likely to happen. Um, you know, for us, we're trying to be the go to place for people from underrepresented communities looking for jobs, looking for support, looking for kind of advice and resources. But you know, it's not straightforward. And, and I think that's why mentoring is such a powerful tool, because to have that kind of insight and to have an individual that you can work with that can support you on a one to one basis is really, really important. I mean, we run CV clinics two or three times a week and they are always overrun. You know, people are desperate for those for that additional support because, you know, they know that you can't just send a blanket CV. It has to be bespoke. It has to be um 
you know, tailored to that in that particular sector or that particular role. But if individuals don't have the confidence to, to go off and do it unless they have those contacts themselves. So, you know, we're working really hard to try and collaborate with as many other organisations as possible. And we really do welcome collaboration. Um, it's a long, it's a long game. Thank you. And um, my last question, um, kind of bringing it back to representation and issues of race is through our research, for example, when we asked about whether, uh, whether our interviewees faced any, um, um, who faced any discrimination or racism in the, in the uh, creative and cultural industries, oftentimes, people are really hesitant, interviewees are really hesitant to name race, even though they give us clear examples of racism or discrimination. It might be uh, uh, covert racism rather than overt racism. Um, but what, what we've noticed with the interviewee is that they um, deflect this racism and they say, well, it's because I don't, uh, because I lack some social skills or because um, I don't speak the same language as in class and in educational background uh, language. Um, so it's me and I need to work on myself to kind of fit. And I find myself out of place. I mean, we, we've heard that quite a lot, you know, being out of place um, in, in these spaces. So I'm just wondering whether um, whether in Creative Access you've, you have, you have, You've heard similar complaints, or uh, or or uh, from mentorships who kind of raise these issues, um, and whether there is any way to to work around it. Um, what am I asking? Is is I think you know how can I? Yeah, it's it's just it was so interesting for for us to to see how they've avoided you know the word race or racism or discrimination and it was like it's me it's me I haven't done this thing or you know I'm lacking this so I'm not very good at networking and that's what and and whether whether we can do something or creative access obviously um, can do something to to say well actually we are providing all of this but also it's it's a it's a bigger problem yeah I think that's right I mean you know. Racism is rarely overt. I mean, obviously it can be, but it's much, it tends to be much more slippery and it tends to be much harder to kind of put your finger on it. And it's, that's what we talk, you know, when we talk about microaggressions, we often mean, you know, there's little things that kind of peg or plug away at somebody and undermine their confidence and their, you know, which is, you know, a terrible, it's one thing for your employer to lose confidence in you. So it's altogether another for you to lose employer confidence in yourself. That's a really horrible thing. Um, so, you know, for sure, it's a bigger issue. Um, and I think that's the power of the peer network that I just mentioned, because, you know, there are, you know, there's no one single panacea for any of this. It's about really looking at kind of having a wholehearted approach to inclusivity. It's about empowering individuals to feel that they um, are in the right place, that they, they they feel valued, they feel able to flourish. It's about empowering employers to it, you know, to make sure that they, they do create that inclusive workplace and it's about you know creating um you know everything from the way that people craft their job descriptions and the imagery on their website through to you know the way that they um manage individuals performance and progression and you know it's so complicated and i think that it's you know the it's not a it, I always like to think of it it's not a destination it's a journey and things are changing all the way and I think that you know the power of peer support is invaluable um we will get there but it's not it's not a straightforward um agenda to, not to crack I should say yeah um it, you know this this has been um amazing thank you so much Josie uh for, for making the time and <coughs> And, and for all the work that you, you are doing, the amazing work that you are doing. So um, I'm sure all the audience are probably are clapping with me. So thank you so much. I've already got a clap. Um, and uh, thank you also for uh, Sadia and, and Shah for their uh, presentation. Uh, very grateful uh, for everybody. Thank you for the audience, for making the time, for coming uh, through and for the questions. Um, I am going uh, to, if you can be so kind, just to fill in the uh, evaluation form, which I've put in the chat 
uh, sorry, I'm going to put in the chat here. Um, and also it will pop up, hopefully, when the Zoom meeting finishes. Um, I'll be really grateful for your feedback. Um, thank you. And hopefully this, converse, this conversation will continue uh, amongst ourselves, amongst our colleagues, amongst the support that we offer to the risk test, to creative access um, and all around. Um, thank you so much um, and have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you.